Okay, so the whole point of this was to kind of go through what I do for a, a wireless assessment of an industrial site, um, kind of where it is that I'm going um, and the stuff that I'm seeing, and then, you know, share some of the, the, the awesome stuff. <laughs> well, I say awesome, but the fun stuff that I find that, that's incredibly wrong um, because, you know, uh, industrial deployments are a whole other animal. Um, it's not your standard office deployment. It's not higher ed. It's definitely not your high, high density user forum. Um, so it, it's it's a lot of fun. I enjoy the challenge. I I uh, I moved over to the industrial sector about six and a half years ago, and I have found it so much more challenging and satisfying um, versus higher ed, which is where I came from. So, um, so I'm Scott. In case you guys didn't know that by now. Um, I do occasionally tweet. I do occasionally write some stuff. Um, I work for a company called uh, GPA, Global Process Automation. Uh, we are industrial integrators, and I am on their OT network and security team. Um, and I'm one of the few of us that actually now specialize in industrial style deployments. So fun stuff. But before we get too far into it, I want to clarify something, um, IT versus OT. Um, the realm that I work in is operational technology, not information technology. So we, um, we, we use the same equipment overall, um, you know, from network switching to server infrastructure uh, and, and a lot of other things, but we run by a, a different rule set. So if you're familiar with the, the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, availability, you know, in the IT world, confidentiality, security, that's your top dog. Uh, followed by the integrity of your data. And then afterwards, availability is kind of second to everything else because you've got to have everything secure. Um, in the industrial OT realm, um, we flip that over because uh, data availability is king, followed up by integrity. Security, while important, um, doesn't hold that high ranking like availability does because if you have um, critical systems that are operating on wireless, the, the getting of data from point A to point B is so much more important on whether or not um, the encryption is there. Because if that data doesn't get there, you could cause some part of that process to stop and that could be uh, detrimental or dangerous to the facility that you're at. So if you're a, a chemical facility and you have a process stop and a valve doesn't close when it's supposed to, that could lead to all manner of problems from you know environmental uh, to loss of life um, and then obviously losing money, which uh, no business wants to do. So I just wanted to roll through that right quick. And so why do we do wireless assessments? Easy question. Everybody knows this. It's to, to get an understanding of the airspace. Um, and it's just as important in industrial, uh, if not more so, because the interferers tend to be a lot different in the industrial space versus what you're looking at, um, at even versus a hospital deployment versus, so versus higher ed versus um, your standard enterprise. It's a different animal and you have different things that you have to take into consideration. So any sort of these uh, projects, be it um, IoT, be it general wireless access, be it specialized point-to-point -point communications, you, you really need to know what's going on um, and the frequencies that are involved. Um, a lot of times I'm called in to, to troubleshoot um, and optimize uh, uh, industrial deployments. Um, and then, you know, we are also called in to assess for greenfield situations, whether it's an old plant that's never had any sort of wireless access before, or it's a brand new build greenfield. And, and that's that's the fun place to play in because you know there's not a pre a lot of pre-existing conditions that you have to worry about uh, mitigate or work around. So, you know, all this, and then you have to look at um, a lot of specialized point-to-point -point communications. So if you want cabinet A to talk to cabinet B, but it's it's you know 200 yards away, and it's going to cost you know 100 grand and to get fiber connected to it, or you could go and spend a thousand dollars and get the right equipment and get that low data rate uh, point to point connection going. That's fantastic, but you still need to know what's going on in that airspace around it for that to be successful. Yeah, you can save a ton of money, but only if it works, you know. So. And then obviously for, for sensor deployments, which is another big thing of, of what I do is go in and check, again, checking out the environment to make sure that everything's gonna be uh, clear and stable as far as the RF is concerned, 
um, for any sort of sensor deployment. And, you know, there's a ton of sensors on 2.4. There are some on 5 gig, um, and there's a fair amount on 900 megahertz. Um, and even a few in the 800 range, that, that, that small part of the 800 ISM. Um, so, you know, having a full understanding of your site, of where you sit uh, RF-wise, will really help determine on whether or not um, whatever wireless initiative project you've got uh, coming is going to be successful or not. And then let's not forget LoRaWAN. Love me some LoRaWAN. I haven't actually gotten to play with the actual uh, LoRaWAN devices yet, but I've already surveyed two different sites um, uh, to clear them for uh, a 900 megahertz LoRaWAN de the deployment. And I'm here next month, I'll be going to a mine in Tennessee to do another really large site um, assessment specifically for a LoRaWAN uh, deployment that they want to do. They want to do LoRaWAN, but they have no idea what's going on on their site. So they gave us a call and we're going to go assess that for them. Um, and, you know, so assessments are assessments. Everybody kind of understands why they need to be done. Um, and it's the same thing for the industrial realm, but for different reasons. Wireless heart. Um, and ISA 100, those are two uh, 802.15.4 based um, uh, uh, protocols. Um, they're different, you know, obviously from the, the upper layers, but they still share those same bases, security base and, and MAC layers and physical aspects. But again, you know, still, it, we're going right back. <laughs> I was just saying that it's all about knowing what's going on so that when you try to deploy these protocols and their associated sensors, um, whether or not it's just going to work. So what do I mean by industrial environments? Okay, that gets confused a lot because immediately when I say industrial environments, so many people think warehouse deployments. Warehouse is a completely different animal um, than full dirty job, you know, uh, industrial sites. So some of the places that I go to are like this. This um, is essentially an indoor train yard um, and it is at a, a brown stock paper facility. And so... While this portion of it is a warehouse, it's not typically what you would see in a warehouse. You don't typically see a bunch of train cars in a warehouse. Um, <laughs> and then, so in the same environment, you have steel train cars where, uh, and uh, reinforced concrete, steel corrugated roof, all fairly low um, in the same open space with the actual stock, um, which is gigantic rolls of paper. So on one hand, you have uh, reflection that's just getting out of hand and on the other, on the other side, um, paper just eats wireless signal. It does. So, uh, this is part of what I'm talking about. And this particular site, even though it's got a roof over the top of it is still fully exposed to the elements and it's in Florida. So you have high heat to deal with, you have all the dust from all the activity and then all the moisture. Um, so it is a multifaceted environment that you really have to take a lot of different things into consideration. So not only is it about the actual RF at that point, then it becomes about equipment survivability as well. Um, I go on top of cranes. This was a lot of fun. Um, this is uh, a giant gantry train uh, at a different pulp mill in their wood yard. Um, and they wanted to get uh, 900 megahertz data connectivity to it. So I was up there doing some spec an. Um, you can see my, my laptop sitting on top of the AC unit over the control cab. Um, and to show you really kind of how high up I was is a nice panoramic shot of the entire facility. This is any paper mill USA. Um, I was probably 120, 130 feet up the air. Um, and I could see two thirds of the entire facility for up there. Um, meanwhile, right behind me, there were three or four process engineers working on control drives. And that's what they wanted communicating back down. To other environments that I go to, this particular facility is uh, manufacturers rubber roofing for commercial places. So I've gone from Holborn Paper to um, uh, roofing manufacturing, and it's all a long process. So there's a lot of chemicals involved um, and a lot of heat and humidity inside this building on top of that. So again, we go back from RF issues also to physical equipment survivability issues. Um, an another shot, and this is again, though it's built inside of a warehouse, most of these places are, um, this particular site made um, foam insulation boards. You know, so again, lots of different chem chemicals in the process. Um, everything's metal, 
you have piping and conduit everywhere. Uh, you know, so it's, these are the environments that where, you know, standard Wi-Fi kind of goes to die. Uh, <laughs> Cause you'll, you'll be at an area of open space and everything's great. And you'll move eight feet under one of those ledges and, and, you know, your, your, uh, your RSSI goes from, you know, 64, 65 and drops all the way to, to low eighties. Uh, and you've moved eight feet. Um, either that or you're overwhelmed by so much reflectivity that, you know, uh, some, some, re some reflectivity is good. A lot of re re reflectivity is bad because then your, retra your retransmits just go through the roof. And so these, again, these are all things you have to take into consideration. <clears throat> Let alone heat and dust are still big impactors here. So you're also looking at longevity of equipment. So what do I do for an assessment? Um, well, to walk you through my process, the first thing I do is I go in and I talk and I talk a lot. Um, you know, I'll have our initial um, uh, project scope of work, but when I get on site, the first thing I want to do is I want to talk to all of the, the, the stakeholders that are involved, the people that are operating in the area, all of the, the users. Um, I want to see what their, their problems are, their trials and tribulations, what's working, what's not working. Do they have specific um, client devices that are having problems versus um, all client devices having problems? You know, is it a difference of OS versus, um, versus just drivers? You know, there, there's a lot of different things. Um, but, you know, that's common stuff for any wireless deployment. But Talking to everybody that's local on site will give you a much better picture than what you're hearing through all your meetings beforehand. Um, and sometimes that can end up changing the scope. Not that I'm a fan of scope creep, but it does happen if you want to get the job done right. Um, then I spend a lot of time getting to know the site. Usually my first day um, after, you know, while I'm talking to everybody, I usually get my site contact um, to give me the, the full tour um, not only of the areas and scope that I need to assess, but a lot of the areas around it so that I'm familiar with what's with what's going on around the areas that I'm supposed to be looking at, because a lot of those areas around will have an impact on the area that I'm there to um, survey. And so it's good to get a, a whole picture. Um, plus two, after you've done uh, a few sites and you've kind of gotten used to certain things, it becomes easier to pick out target areas of where you specifically want to go and do some spec and and get some samples because you get to know to look for certain kinds of devices or kind of suspect areas that um, are more susceptible to be producing some RF interference. Um, and it's it's crazy just how much you can find in these sites. Um, but that's that's a whole nother discussion of uh, spec and so. I do um, uh, wireless, uh, I do passive wireless surveys um, because I wanna see everything that's going on. Um, and that gives me a, a lot of, of information to look at and, and go through. Um, this is just kind of an example um, of actually the rubber roofing site that we saw earlier. This is the floor plans. I'm an air magnet guy um, and you can see just gave, from looking at the initial um, passive survey, they have they have issues. Um, they got 23 APs clam, crammed into this in this site, and they've got large you know gaps of coverage. Um, long story short, it turned out to be a ton of uh, of uh, RF interference that was causing all this. Uh, but again, that's that's a story for another time. And then there's my favorite spectrum analyzing. Um, I love spec and that's, that's, that's fun. I really enjoy it. I like seeing the raw RF values. Uh, I'm a meta geek guy. So that, that visual aspect of it really helps me understand <clears throat> uh, what's going on and the uh, different interferers that uh, uh, come up um, and it helps me identify. And then a lot of times will also help me um, dial in to where those actually are. So we can see if it's something that we can mitigate or if we're just gonna to have to work around. So this is actually a cap of um, when I was on top of that blue crane, this was the 900 megahertz spectrum analysis that I was doing while I was sitting up there. Um, and I happened to be in the right place at the right time because they were um, replacing a, a drive uh, up in the top um, in the operating cab and they had not put the shielding in place yet. And they tested it for a minute 
And so this is a 60 second capture of the interference that that uh, drive was kicking out in the 900 megahertz realm. Um, you can see there are two control signals there uh, come around channel 911 and 920, 921. Um, that are able to punch through, but you can see that's about a 30 point uptick in the uh, noise floor uh, at a very high density, you know, um, of utilization as far as just what it was was crushing. So I knew at that point that if we were going to do a 900 megahertz link, we were either going to have to do something that was not spread spectrum and keep it down low just to avoid that, or we were going to have to go with another frequency. But it's amazing just how much a one minute capture can tell you uh, about something like that. So Scott, this is really cool, but I got to ask, how are you doing a 900 megahertz uh, spectrum analysis and channelizer? Because I got on eBay and found an old uh, Y-Spy 900X and they don't make them anymore, but even the newest versions of channelizer are still compatible with it. Oh, gotcha. Nice. Um, yeah. And I'm always on the lookout for, for uh, more of those whenever I can find them, because I know the one I've got is not going to last forever. So, you know, um, I found it on eBay for 250 bucks. I was really happy about that. Um, I just found out one of my coworkers snatched one up. So I might be talking to him and seeing if I can, you know, maybe co uh, coerce him to sell it to me, but we'll see. Um, I'm also starting to experiment with some SDR uh, software defined radios um, that can, because there's a lot of those that are down in those frequencies, but there's not exactly the greatest um, software for spec amp for them because it's more of a ham thing, but I'm still learning. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of open source software for it. So that'll be interesting. I'm sure I'll end up yammering about it on my blog when I figure that out. Uh, but yeah, so 900 megahertz is, is a pretty big deal. A lot of vendors are moving away from 900 megahertz, but on the other hand, a whole lot of IOT, uh, industrial IOT vendors are moving towards 900 megahertz because of its resiliency, um, its distance, you know, its low data rate. So who cares? Um, but the fact that it can punch through a lot, uh, and it's amazing how many radio vendors, um, don't support 900 megahertz anymore either, which is unusual. But, uh, again, that's a subject for another day. Cause I, I just, I enjoy the whole 900 megahertz spectrum. Um, anyway, this was a great capture. This told me a lot and we were able to avoid and, and mitigate some issues at that particular site for this 60 second capture. So that's 60 seconds probably save them thousands of dollars of trying multiple different equipment that would fail. Uh, let's see. Then um, once I've been on site, usually I'm, if it's a big site, I'm on site for about a week, uh, data gathering, talking to everybody, running scans, doing, um, uh, doing spec and, and whatnot. Um, then I head back to the house here in my, my office and I spend about a week compiling all that data and analyzing it. Um, and creating a, a, a nice nice report. Um, now, granted, I don't normally print everything out <laughs> to give to everybody. It's usually in, in digital format, but um, you know, I have to break everything down by frequency. I have to break everything down in layman's terms because the majority of the engineers I end up dealing with um, OT wise uh, are not heavy on the networking and wireless side. Uh, you know, as with any type of report, you need to know your audience um, on how you you break things down. Um, so I use a lot of pictures. Pictures are fun. Uh, and, you know, all of my assessments over the past three, four years have been very well received. And I have helped a lot of industrial sites um, really come full circle with their deployments. Um, we do a lot of, I specifically do a lot of work for West Rock. They're one of the big paper companies out there. Um, oh, gosh, Vondrell, another big paper company, um, industrial I'm sorry, uh, international paper. Um, we do a lot in pulp and paper. That's probably 50% of our, our, our business, but we do a lot of other um, uh, smaller, um, a lot of specialty chemical too. But it, it's fun. I have a good time doing it. Um, you know, but I, I also, in the process of all this, run across a lot of just terrible stuff that's just, you know, any one of us would, would see this and be like, well, what are you doing? What were you thinking about that? But you also have to keep in mind that when this stuff is installed, a lot of times it's installed by people who don't have the background in it. They don't understand the dynamics of even proper antenna selection, let alone how to mount one. 
Um, you know, so they're just putting it where they're told to put it. Uh, so this is a really good example um, at a facility I was in. <clears throat> so we'll start on the, on the right side. That is a uh, two and a half foot by two and a half foot wide column of thick, dense, reinforced concrete, steel reinforced concrete. Um, they have, this is in a very similar area to what we looked at before, as far as while it is covered, it's exposed to the elements. Um, and so they're using um, an indoor access point with external antennas. Um, none of the connections were any sort of uh, taped up or uh, I, I usually like to use that rubberized vulcanizing tape and just get Home Depot or whatever um, to cover up all the metal connections. So, you know, the antenna cables are all rusty. Um, I, 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 what, I didn't even get up there to take a look at, um, uh, at the, the Cat5 that was going into it. But the real obvious thing here is they've got the, these Omni antennas, high gain Omni antennas mounted flat to these columns. And, you know, a, a big thing with Omnis, that's gonna, even on a low gain antenna, when you're mounted up against a service like that, it's gonna warp um, your, uh, your transmission out of it. So let's just jack that up a notch and put nine dB antennas on there and really warp it out and then wonder why we have connectivity issues on our fork trucks that are running around. So that was pretty awesome. So, uh, you know, mounting it wrong and not sealing anything up. Then on the left, uh, what's really great is again, I don't know why they all want to default to the using these nine dB Omnis. Um, but instead of actually mounting them the proper fashion, they decided a 45 degree angle would be super awesome and really help the, the Wi-Fi pancake coming out of these things. Uh, and, and you know what, let's just bounce it off this corrugated steel ceiling and hopefully we'll get some coverage. Well, they did get some coverage up above everything. <laughs> Not a whole lot of it really actually made it down to where the users were. Um, Another site, well, actually, this is multiple sites. Um, I find these little gems stuffed into cabinets or different places because one of their guys decided that, you know, they, they knew how to program their Linksys home router and they wanted some wireless access there uh, uh, on site and uh, they didn't want to tell anybody or um, a vendor came in and said, we need remote access, we need wireless access to our piece of equipment. Um, we're just gonna put this in here. We're not gonna tell anybody. Uh, the two on the right were at the same facility and I was able to show them and they, they, they got rid of them pretty quickly. But um, you know, you're putting an off the shelf Best Buy device in, in a hostile environment. And these are devices that as we all know have other capabilities other than just wireless, they're DHCP servers. Um, and then they wonder why devices are shutting down on the hardline network because they just inadvertently uh, decided to have DHCP running on there because they didn't know any better. And so now when they're adding equipment, taking equipment, adjusting equipment, it's getting new addresses that don't jive with the rest of the process and things stop working. Um, all because you thought you'd spend 70 bucks at Walmart um, and make yourself a little bit of convenience. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, then you see guys like this again, you know, we're going to mount it up right next to a wall, but it still gets hit, um, by whatever vehicle was driving by breaks an antenna starts ripping out connections. And amazingly enough, this radio was still transmitting. Um, it just really wasn't going anywhere because, uh, the one antenna that was attached, that radio was turned off that, and the one that was broadcasting was the one they had enabled, um, you know, so this is like, this is commonplace of, of what I find in a lot of these places. So it's, uh, it's interesting um, and it's challenging, but at the same time, you end up having a, a really just ridiculous amount of, of WTF moments because you just wondering what the hell these people were thinking when they put this up to begin with. Um, this was a tank farm out in Mississippi uh, and they wondered why all of their um, wireless relays were, were not working anymore um, when every single one of them is, was exposed bare metal on all of their connections and they were getting water into their LMR connections. So, you know, you get water in LMR cable, it's done. Um, you, you can't use it anymore. 
Uh, but they were all like, well, we looped it down so water wouldn't get in our cabinets. Well, yeah, hey, great job. Water's not in your cabinets, but your LMR cable's ruined because once you get water in there, let alone the condition of all the connections and the corrosion that's going on in these things. This deployment was only a year old, by the way. Wow. And every, every one of them was like that. So this is down coastal Mississippi. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, salt air and radios are not a good combination. So make sure, make sure you seal everything up. But it's, this is the common stuff that I, that I run across. And it's, it's, um, it's not overly complicated. It's a lot of common sense. And to be honest with you, a lot of it is, is Wi-Fi 101. But the people who are putting these systems in are being uh, having the stuff sold to them by salespeople who don't deploy it. And when it time comes for deployment, they're like, they're on their own. Um, they read the instruction book. Okay, this is how you connect it. This is how you mount it. They put it where they want it. Um, and then they just hook it up and they walk away. And they have no concept of the care that needs to be taken to the equipment um, to protect it so it will last over time. Um, and that's, that's just a common thread I see in all of these different environments, which is really sad, but, you know, slowly things are changing um, and people are starting to pay more attention to the gear that they put out there because they realize they're just throwing away money because they, they put up a deployment that should have lasted them five, six years and it's lasting them one. Um, and just for those who aren't familiar, the, the typical uh, life cycle um, for things like this in an industrial environment um, is usually about 10 years. They do not subscribe to the, the, the four and five year life cycle that um, enterprise and higher ed and, and, and the medical fields do. Uh, they put it in there. They expect it to, to be going for 10 years before they even consider putting money into replacing again. So that even puts more pressure on your project initiation uh, to make sure that um, not only is your solution engineered properly, but it's also implemented properly. So it's going to last them the life cycle that they expect. Um, you know, there's a big conception in a lot of these places that, you know, just wireless is terrible. We don't want everyone to go to it. Well, if this is what you're seeing, I would agree. You know, if, if it is not um, implemented properly, absolutely, it's going to end up being terrible, which is sad because overall wireless is actually fairly robust and can survive a, a lot of uh, mishaps and whatnot. But um, you know, if, if you just don't care, uh, you're going to have problems. And this, all right, now this wasn't wireless, but I thought this was awesome and I wanted to share it. This was at a port down in Charleston, South Carolina, and they were having problems with some of their wireless systems. Um, and they couldn't understand uh, what was going on because they kept losing their data connections. Well, after going through and checking it all out, the actual wireless was fine but their fiber backhauls from all their sites were what the problem was. So what you're seeing here, can you guys see my cursor moving around? Yep. All right, so this is the conduit pipe that is completely wow. rusted through. This is the jacketed fiber that is <laughs> wrapped around um, uh, the post up here that is actually holding that conduit in place. Yikes. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> And this is the exact same scenario on a different um, conveyor boom arm. So what happened to that conduit? Rust. Wow. It's, it's the salt air is eating up the conduit and they're not doing the maintenance on it. So then it falls out. It's the armor jacketed fiber that's holding everything up. So what had happened is a couple of the fibers were getting cut while it was sitting here holding up this rusty conduit. So a lot of times too, your wireless problems aren't even related to wireless but it all goes, it all goes back to upkeep that's not taking place. But I just thought this was really awesome and people need to see the fact that, you know, sometimes terrible fiber can, can be the culprit of your uh, wireless issues too. Um, and this whole site was full of it. They probably needed, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of just infrastructure renovation in order to straighten out all their issues. Um, and I was told by the guy, ah, we'll just do another run of fiber. So as opposed to fixing the problem, they would rather just do another run of fiber right next to it outside of that conduit. Hmm. So, interesting things that you run across that you got to deal with in a, in a multitude of different environments. 
but still it's a lot of fun. This one actually perplexed me for a little while. And it was, it was the second day that I was on site that I finally found this um, and then realized the fiber pathing wise, what cabinets they were going back to. Um, and those were the ones that were being affected because just enough light was getting through and they hadn't had their fiber tested and certified um, in, in years. Um, had they had been doing the, the simple fiber recertification, the recertification, they would have come across that a long time ago. But intend that instead they waited until it started affecting a lot of other systems. So uh, good times, guys. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. That was really cool, Scott. Thanks for sharing. Love all the visuals, all the examples, all the the bad fi. Yeah, pictures are worth a thousand words, you know, and um, I can sit here and describe it, but you know, some of that <laughs> stuff, man, it, it's just nuts. Um, it's yeah, and I, why, see, I why? see a lot more than I have pictured here, but a lot of sites I am not allowed to um, mm -hmm. take pictures. So nearly everything you showed had those nine dB omni antennas. I don't know what, what is it the, is. Yeah, everybody seems to love these. I, I, I guess the, their thought is the bigger the better. Um, they're not paying attention to uh, uh, radiation patterns on antennas and how they work. Yeah. So instead, they want to they want to install a 9 dB Omni at 25 feet up in the air and then wondering why they're having terrible signal at seven feet off the floor. Mm. You know, um, unless they're directly beneath the antenna because they're getting that weird kind of push down lobe. But ah, so um, the fix is just to angle the antenna 45 that was degrees the fix was to do that 45 <laughs> degree right, you know, but oh, still boy. even then now probably 60 70 percent of that coverage is just going straight to the ceiling. Right. <clears throat> yeah, that was pretty awesome. Not good. <laughs> <clears throat> so we got a, a few uh, good questions from the audience and I want to invite any attendees with other questions to drop them in the Q&A. Anders um, had a question while we were talking about spectrum analysis hardware. I wanted to know, Scott, if you've ever tested the RF Explorer gear. I have not. I have heard about it. Um, I don't know what the cost of it is. Uh, once I started getting into the uh, Metagate gear, my boss was like, okay, we'll pay for this, but, you know, um, and we're going to pay for your air magnet, but, but we're not going to pay for anything else for a while because yeah. it costs us a lot of money. <clears throat> um, uh, like I said, I, I've heard about it. I haven't had a chance to play with it, but I, I totally would like to. Uh, I'm all about having as many tools in my toolbox as possible. Yeah, me too. <clears throat> Question here from Andrew. He says, I'm in a heavy manufacturing environment and these APs get filthy. Mm -hmm. Will dust either on the antennas or the AP itself affect the coverage provided by the AP? Well, on the APs, it will because it'll keep that heat in that AP. And so, you know, um, when you look at the design of most APs, they're, they're designed with, with uh, heat exhaustion in mind and dissipating the heat off those boards. If you mm -hmm. trap that heat in there, um, it's slowly going to just going to degrade your circuitry, which, yeah, that's going to end up affecting your coverage, but more than likely it's going to affect um, uh, communication values and you're going to end up getting a lot more retransmits and things of that, things of that nature, as opposed to the coverage. So sometimes I have found that, um, even with the passive surveys that can be misleading, um, which is why you have to really get a full picture of everything that's going on and try to really identify every AP to see what the situation is. And you're exactly right. You want to look at stuff. Uh, and if you have thick dust coverage on it, um, it's, it's not good for the access point. It's going to shorten that life dramatically, but it can absolutely affect um, uh, communications. Now, as yeah. far as the antenna is concerned, I don't know. That's a little out of my, um, uh, my scope there. Um, Jim, would you have a better idea? I wouldn't think that dust on the antenna per se would cause an issue. It might depend on the material the dust is coming from. You know, it might be some unique no, it's, it's, materials and some some sites like, but yeah if you're in a metal processing facility and a lot of that's like metal flake dust i could see that um but if it's um uh, like a powder form dust that's non-metallic i don't see where that would cause an issue that's a great question yeah. i need to look into that that was kind of my thought too i i think i'd be more worried about you know if you want to get a 10 years of life out of an ap anything that's going to increase the heat is is going to be bad news for the lifespan of that ap so question here from uh jan he says do you ever meet slash use daz uh slash radiating cable slash leaky feeder solutions leaky rf um 
I have only run across leaky RF in one instance, um, and it was actually a well-engineered deployment um, for uh, uh, roving uh, load-carrying robots. Um, and it kept all of their Wi-Fi at floor level that as far as the connectivity that those bots needed. And they stayed probably within uh, 10 to 15 feet of the leaky RF cables. Um, I know one of the big issues with leaky RF is if you don't get it oriented properly, um, your uh, signal propagation is going to be all off and you're not going to get a, a continuous connection. But that particular deployment was very well engineered. The guys who installed it knew what they were doing. But that's the only personal um, experience that I've run across with it. I've never deployed it myself. That's cool. I've never seen it. I've only just read about it. Yeah, um, I was in a refrigeration plant <clears throat> where they were actually making refrigeration units. And so mm -hmm. they have this assembly line. And a part of the assembly line is the little box carrying a bit, a large piece from one, one line to go to another line to get more, par uh, get more parts. And that's where they had the leaky RF to keep um, those bots going back and forth. And if you haven't heard of it, um, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea is you take a long piece of coaxial cable mm -hmm. and actually penetrate the shielding. Correct. So that the signal that would <coughs> normally be contained in there to lead to an antenna actually leaks intentionally out of the cable, providing like yeah, a micro and, cell of um, coverage wherever you make you're those. You're not just using like your standard RG6 most of the time. Usually it's specialized cable that actually has a flat spot along your um, exposed area um, to maximize its uh, signal propagation. Right. <clears throat> Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, leaky uh, RF is weird. I, I, I wish I had more of a chance to play with it just because it's, you know, it's like 900 megahertz oddball. So I, I like that oddball stuff. Yeah, definitely. I would love to see something like that. Um, last question here from Andrew and uh, uh, this one could be its own webinar. In fact, I think we've done a few webinars on this topic, but he says, uh, what external antennas would you recommend? And we, we've definitely done some webinars. Check out our YouTube channel for uh, antenna uh, webinars. But uh, Scott, what, what are your feelings? It's probably well, not 9 dB omnis not 9 dB in, the, in no, the sites but, you're at. You know, this, this is one of those great, it depends, right? Because every single environment is going to be different and it's going to call for different things. Um, I have used uh, everywhere from uh, low, as far as external is concerned, low, low gain um, omnis, um, a fair amount of directionals um, from full blown, you know, 90 and 120 degree sectors <clears throat> down to more uh, narrow uh, 30 and 20 degree wide beam widths. Um, it all depends on what you're trying to do, where your users are, and then what's going on around it. Um, because it's, it's not always about getting that signal there. It's also about getting that return information from your end device. So, you know, if you can put a directional in, but that directional is 600 feet away, is your handheld zebra scanner going to be able to make it back? Now, if it's just there to read data from from the ap wherever it's coming from that's fine but if you have to push data back that's a whole different ball game so then you have to start taking other antenna options uh into consideration so yeah i, I can't really um answer that with uh with a i use this antenna all the time because it, it's different every single time and to be honest with you there's a lot of places where i tend to prefer ap's with internal antennas specifically because a lot of the newer ones, uh, most Arubas, a lot of the newer Cisco's now, um, their uh, internal antennas are coming, are having a 90 degree, or I'm sorry, not 90 degree, but a 30 degree internal mechanical down tilt built into them. So as opposed to that, that donut, they're, they're pushing down more of a, a circular cone, um, which is also what gets you a little bit more height out of them. Because the older Cisco APs, I think they, the max height they recommended those was like 20, 25 feet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, all of the Aruba stuff I know from the 305 and higher, um, the, I know they can handle 35 feet or so because they've got that mechanical down tilt of their antennas pushing that down. Um, I have a lot of situations where those actually work very well. And if it's a more harsh environment, we just put them in a box, you know, mm -hmm. run to Home Depot, get yourself a little plastic box mounted in there and you're good to go. Um, yeah, you don't have to worry about uh, connectors and right. um, 
drip loops and it, all well and that, that's the yeah. big thing is is it takes a lot of the complexity out of the the installation um and a lot less protection is involved if you're just putting it in one of those boxes the only thing you have to really worry about at that point is heat um but you know is what it is right if you if you have just heat but you're not combining it with humidity or dust a lot of times the ap's will be just fine but if you're you're combining that with the humidity and dust, then then it becomes more of a detrimental milkshake to it. Gotcha, gotcha. <clears throat> well, thanks, Scott. I think that's all the time we have for the uh, the main content here. Appreciate you joining us, and uh, Heather. I think we can transition to Eric. Um, awesome. There he is, out from hiding. Eric, welcome, welcome. It's your time to shine. So, Scott, sorry, we're gonna steal. Uh, sharing back from you but awesome awesome session super fun um i know everyone loved it so good stuff so eric you're up all right awesome thank you scott and thanks for having me today this is seven minutes with seven signal this is where we take some little features inside seven signal kind of you know look at it a little bit more closely in order to understand how helpful and impactful it can be to your business Today, I don't know if you guys are aware, but Seven Signal is in a lot of really harsh environments. Steel mills, paper mills, a lot of the things that we were talking about today, some of you, some of you customers might even be out there. And so what I wanted to do is just kind of share how Seven Signal is so useful in some of these environments. And so I'm just gonna, you know, take a couple of minutes here, of course, to share with you some spectral analyses that we get from Seven Signal. So if you can see that, just give me the thumbs up. All right. And so as you can see here, you know, what's important to note is that every single Sapphire Eye does have a spectrum chip in it. And when we put it in a location, like a steel yard, or we've got these things, um, you know, kind of all over the place, and they're just, they're stationary. And so they're monitoring what's going on in the air 24 hours a day, and they are capturing the energy that's in the air. Now, in a lot of these really large environments, like the, the train yards and the steel yards and all of that, there is a reliance on 2.4 because, you know, we get that nicer propagation. And so the spectral analysis is really important in just seeing, okay, is the 2.4 as clean as it can be? And if not, what are the things that we can do? Because we really do depend upon it heavily. And so this is just an example of a spectral analysis of 2.4. You can see 1, 6, and 11. Remember, time is on the y-axis and we're water falling down from the beginning of the day to the end of the day, or in this case, from the beginning of the week to the end of the week. And that's a really important note, guys. I mean, trying to catch Wi-Fi interference is like trying to catch a ghost. And so to have one of these in place that's just continually capturing 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so you can see right here at the moment, look at this, guys, you see this east to west, this interference that just wide band cuts all the way across uh, the, the spectrum. And it's really important to note that there is a timestamp associated with that, you know, and you can actually see, wow, you know, at 3.30 in the afternoon on this particular day, you can actually see maybe, you know, what was going on at that time and perform a correlation. Now, as we know, these environments are pretty harsh, and they're not just harsh on 2.4, they're harsh on 5 gigahertz as well. And I wanted to show you this here. Oh, here's another 2.4, look at that. Channel 11 really heavily utilized, but more importantly, I mean, there's some really, you know, kind of some nasty stuff taking place over here that could be causing some issues for folks who are on channel six. You know, instead, you know, maybe we should be using more of channel one and, I'm sorry, channel 11. We should be using more of channel one and channel six if channel 11 is going to be, you know, really this hot to try. All right, so the other thing I want to show you here is on five gigahertz, there are some nasty things that we have to be careful of on five gigahertz. So here's an example. You see these little snakes, these little wiggle worms? I mean, these are, I mean, these could be a variety of things that are taking place in the environment, in a harsh environment. Uh, motion sensors, security cameras, motion detectors, all sorts of things that could be taking place, really interfering. You can see the Wi-Fi um, 
the Wi-Fi signature right here where my mouse is on the 20 megahertz wide channel at the same time from top to bottom all throughout the week. You see the wiggle worm, you see the snake, and this kind of interference could really be causing intermittent problems with anybody using these Uni3 channels. And when we can see it, we can now make some decisions accordingly. For example, hey, let's use more of Uni1 if we can, based upon what we see on the chart. Well, there you have it, guys. That's what I wanted to share with you today, using 7Signal in order to see what is going on in the air uh, so that we can make decisions and we can act accordingly and remediate and do the best we can. And so with that, I just want to remind you, we, you and me, can't see or hear Wi-Fi, but 7Signal can. Thanks for joining us today. And back to you, Heather. Awesome. Well, yeah, make sure you get seven signals so you can see your wiggle worms. I'm going to be doing this for the rest of the day. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. Thanks, Jim, Scott. Really awesome session. We're already getting really great feedback from it. So awesome. thank you. And, and thanks to all of you for joining us. We would not be here without you. We will be back same time, same place. So we will see you there. Bye-bye.